Millennials say out with blogs, in with podcasts. And is TV doomed thanks to ad blockers? This is episode 50 of Media Unplugged, the podcast that goes behind the spin to reveal what's really happening in media. Media Unplugged with Tom A. Sacker and Mark Ramsey. Welcome to Media Unplugged. I am Mark Ramsey. And I'm Tom Asacker, and happy first day of fall, my favorite season. First day of fall and episode 50 all at once. There's some kind of, I don't know, something magic happening in the in air. In the time. air. It's in the air. I wish it were happening on this show today because i got to tell you, I don't think I've ever been so irritated by our list of topics as I am today. <laughs> Yeah, it was a struggle for me to even throw any kind of insight into this. I'm kind of hoping that you're going to run with it. By the way, um, I can't think of a worse way to start the show than by saying it was a struggle for you to provide insight. <laughs> and we've got 20 minutes to go. So, so everybody's going to tune out now? Okay, I've got, now. I've got a great rant later. No, I'm kidding. That, no. Actually, I think we've got a lot to talk about here. This is really interesting. The first one, Millennials Say Out With Blogs In With Podcasts. This is from a piece in Adweek, which frankly should know better. And the title is, Why Recent Grads Are Breaking Up With Blogs in Favor of Podcasts. I get it, the breaking up thing, right? That's to diminish recent... I get it. Okay. (laughs) So here's how it opens. Bobby Hobart. I love (laughs) Bobby Hobart. Recently graduated from a small business school outside of Boston. Like many college students before him, his postgraduate plans were a little murky. Quote, Everyone was talking about what they were doing next, he says. At 22, I still haven't necessarily found what I want to do with my life. Oh, Jesus. At 22, he can't. I I haven't figured it out yet myself. You know, but there's only one solution (laughs) to that, and you know what that solution is, Tom. Podcasting. Exactly right. (laughs) Hobart's dream included starting a lifestyle brand, but he wants to build his credibility first. Why? Of course, because he has no credibility, Tom. He's 22. He's 22. A few years ago, his instinct may have been to start a blog because giving your opinions where you don't know anything is exactly what you should be doing. But Hobart says he loves to talk and was never the best writer (laughs) because that's that's what this medium is for. Bad writers who love to talk. So uh, a different medium had more appeal, a personal podcast. With his Purpose in Youth podcast, he hopes to tell the stories of people who have found what they're passionate about, even though he has not. He was preparing to launch the first episode. He hadn't even launched the first episode at the time of this, Tom. I haven't found one. I went and searched for it. I didn't find one yet. But listen, <laughs> I got a kick out of the uh, the subtitle and the caption under the, uh, the photo at the top. Because the subtitle reads, Millennials shift to audio to build their personal brands. Yeah. And then there's a photo of two millennial women in front of a microphone. And the caption reads... Katie Roach created her drunk sex podcast a few years after graduating. Now, I don't know if that's the kind of personal brand that Tom Peters was talking about <laughs> building when he coined the term <laughs> way back in 1997. <laughs> I, I, I thought you were referring to the other picture on the second page where it, said, where it has a picture of Bobby along with a quote. The quote says, at 22, I still haven't necessarily found what it is I want to do in my life. And then underneath it, it says, Bobby Hobart, purpose in the youth. I thought, well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so here's some of the points made by this art. By the way, I think that the whole idea of, you know, talking rather than writing, I think, I, who was it? I, I Was it Dickens who uh, was the first to say, talking shit is easier than writing shit? Well, that, that's it's a sign of our times. <laughs> I mean, why why waste time thinking when you can just, talk. I mean, all of our leaders do that all the time, right? (laughs) Today, that's true. So here's what the piece says, and I have to take issue with some of these points. Podcasts pair well with shorter attention spans, allowing listeners to do other things while consuming content. Actually, they don't pair well with shorter attention spans at all. It doesn't take, here it says, listening to a podcast doesn't require the same amount of effort needed to read a long-form blog post. Well, that's wrong. First of all, people don't read long-form blog posts. They skim them. They read headlines. That we've already talked about. That we know. <laughs> In fact, it takes much more effort to consume a podcast than it does to consume a blog, co- blog, blog post because there is no shortcut to consume a podcast, and there are abundant shortcuts to consume blog posts. So that sentence is wrong on its face. I don't think people understand when people listen to podcasts and when they read text online Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you cannot work 
and listen to a podcast at the same time. That's I've true. tried this. I've tried to run it in the background while I was doing something else. You can't do it. Your attention has to be on the podcast. The only way you can have your ears and your brain on the podcast is if you have your ears on the brain numb to everything else it's doing, which is like driving a car, you know, mowing your lawn, sitting at the beach. You can't listen to a podcast if your brain is engaged in something else. I'm sorry, Tom. I missed everything you said because I was trying to work while you were talking. That's what I'm talking about right there. (laughs) This is what I'm saying. Quote, I spend all this one-on-one time with these shows, and that's the kind of engagement and connection you would be aiming for with the personal blog, Congress, Congress says, and one of the other people quoted. But you get more transparency with the podcast host. Not only do you have words, but you get their tone and their voice and their personality. It's just a completely different and more immersive experience. That I do agree with. That I think is true. Then it goes on to say, podcasts also provide safe spaces for listeners to be alone with the content and process it as they need to. What the hell is that? What mean? does that safe mean? Space. I don't know. Look, first of all, it's an easy way to differentiate yourself. At least that's what it appears to be. Because everyone's on Facebook, except me. And right. isn't Facebook kind of the same thing as blogging? I mean, you have your own little audience you write for and you share things with. So so if everybody's doing Facebook, which is blogging, mm-hmm. then you want to stand out. So you say, okay, I'll do a podcast and I'll have people listening to me as well as reading what I want to talk about. Well, see, and- you've hit something very important and summed up in this sentence and my take from it. Sam Solomon, host of the Designer News podcast DNFM, says, quote, Podcasts are a new distribution channel. It gives people a new way to discover who you are. In other words, Tom, it's not about you, the listener. It's about me. Well, none of this is about the audience. Oh, listen, <laughs> because if it were, people would be looking at all of it saying, people can't consume this stuff. We need to stop doing it. I mean, listen, I get more people reading my stuff now that I stop publishing every week. They go, oh, thanks, Tom. I said, okay, good. Yeah, they've actually said to you, publish less, right? Absolutely. <laughs> because they love me so much, they just don't have time for me. They love you so much, they want less of you. They want less of me, well, right. That's how I feel about candy. Um, <laughs> Conger predicts that once discovering and sharing becomes easier, the floodgates will be open for podcasts to truly take off. Again, completely wrong. The problem is not <laughs> discovery. And sharing is not the problem of me, the audience. It's the problem of you, the podcast producer. Uh, The problem that I see with so much of the talk about podcasts nowadays is that people can't distinguish between something that has genuine value to an audience at, at scale versus something which is pure vanity. It's not a podcast. It's a vanity cast more than anything. Yeah. You're right. Young at people scale, are, at scale is the key. At right? scale because is the key. Otherwise, everybody's going to podcast, and they'll have their six friends. That's what we used to do when we were kids. We would go out, stand by the fence, and the six of us would bullshit with each other. So <laughs> we were doing like live podcasting. You were doing. You were doing the first podcast. The first podcast. And you exactly. didn't even know it. I just love the way it ends. Young people are realizing that podcasts are part of building a personal brand. I know. I, yeah, I know. We, like like when Katie Roach goes out and starts interviewing, they're going to pull up her drunk sex <laughs> podcast and say, uh, I don't think so. Nice work. We are role modeling a brand new profession for people who are in college now, and that is really amazing to be a part of. What are you even talking about? I don't know. I don't know. You're listening to Media Unplugged with Tom Asecker and Mark Ramsey. We really put a lot, we shed a lot of light on that one, Tom. We hope you're listening because you might be trying to do something else at the same time and we or, know that doesn't work. Or do your own podcast while you're listening to this, which, would, which apparently wouldn't be the first time. Is TV <laughs> doomed thanks to ad blockers? This one got me upset too, Tom. Why? Because they use the word doomed? I mean, oh my God, right? Oh, think, TV is doomed. Everything's no, that's, doomed. <laughs> no, that, that's, that hyperbole you have to blame on me, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, so here's the piece. Is No, actually, they did use that word. Is TV doomed? Two-thirds did. of young millennials use an ad blocker to watch, study says. So here it is. It's from uh, The Wrap, which, by the way, is cluttered with irritating ads. <laughs> um, 
If you've been wondering where all the young TV viewers have gone when they don't have cable but are up to date on The Walking Dead, a new study from creative agency Anatomy Media might have the answer. And the potential cost to TV networks and studios could run into the hundreds of millions. Oh, God. According to their survey of 2,500 Americans, 18 to 24, 18 to 24, important demo, 69% use some form of video piracy on a regular basis. It gets worse, the article says. 61% even share a password for a subscription service with family or friends. Uh Uh-oh. I didn't know you couldn't do that. (laughs) But worst of all, perhaps, is that because (laughs) they visit piracy sites with invasive and possibly malicious ads, much more of this demographic is using ad blockers than the U.S. population at large. 63% say they use an ad blocker on at least one device. Now, the thing about that sentence that got me, Tom... (laughs) Was the 3%? No, no, no. It was, but worst of all, perhaps, is that because they visit piracy sites with invasive and possibly malicious ads, in other words, not because they resent the intrusive nature of online advertising at large, but because they visit this particular kind of pernicious evil site. You see what I mean? Of course I see what you mean. So... But, I mean, this is technology, right? This is so, technology. So, so content producers, uh, advertisers, they need to employ a technology solution to stop that from happening. It's well, a that's, game. That's, this is a crazy game oh, that we're playing. it's such a game. Uh, listen to when I tell you some of the material uh, in, in this article and some of the stuff I found. The study found a fun- strong correlation between streaming piracy and ad blocking and hypothesizes that the two behaviors are reinforcing. Oh, wow. Again, baloney. I mean, obviously what we're talking about is 18 to 24s 80, 24 year olds who are intimately involved in all things digital. Those two things are going to correlate because they correlate with being a digitally intensive 18 to 24, not because they correlate with each other. Right. 64% of young millennials actually install an ad blocker specifically to avoid ads on videos, to which I say, duh. <laughs> <laughs> Anatomy uh, co founder uh, Mira Belli is her name, told the rap this points to ad-supported networks losing millions in revenue because most of them aren't using an ad block wall, which just so we understand the terminology, Tom. Ad-supported networks. So so, So, so so, so nobody's registering that these ads are being streamed because the, the streamed ads are being blocked? Well, if you use an ad block wall because the blocker of a blocker is called a wall. Right. Okay. A big, beautiful wall. A big, beautiful, (laughs) the best wall ever. So she said, think about the Olympics on NBC. We kept testing it to see if they had an ad blocking wall. And nope, you could watch all their stuff and never see an ad. That's where two thirds of their missing millennials went. Well, I was thinking about that. You know, many of the networks do not block ad blockers. And I was thinking, why would that be? If they know the ad is not seen, why is it in their interest to not block the blocker? (laughs) And isn't the obvious answer, Tom, because if they can report larging, larger usage numbers, well, that has a halo effect? that's what I was trying effect. to say. That's that what is- I'm trying to say. I mean, if I'm blocking an ad that's supposed to be streaming from some piracy site, how do they know that I didn't see that ad? If, if, if they're measuring that I'm streaming it, it's kind of confusing to me. Well, but here's because what I know. Because we're, not, we're assume, not hooked up with, like, little Nielsen monitors. These no, but I, I'm going to assume, if they, and I'm assuming this, that if the ad is blocked, then you, the publisher, know that the ad was blocked, and you're not reporting to your client that they just had an exposure. Yeah, an but wait a minute. But these are piracy sites. No, no, so no. These are are, are right now the advertisers about, paying the piracy sites, too? Yes, they are, of course. But now they're talking about networks, ABC, Fox, NBC. Okay. CBS. CBS is the only one that uses an ad blocker wall. So you can watch the other stuff. And that's why I was thinking, well, why is it in their interest to not block the ad blockers? And the, I, ca- I can't imagine there's any answer other than they're so terrified by the erosion of their audiences across all platforms that they're afraid to institute any obstacle to viewership, even if that obstacle undercuts their revenue stream. Wow, it is a little catch-22, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Here's what she says, and she goes on to say, you know who has ad block walls? Some of those streaming piracy sites. So they're profiting, <laughs> profiting doubly at the expense of the network in some cases. That's but what I was thing. saying. But here's the thing, Tom. The streaming piracy sites, if they know anything, they know that their content is worth it. Their content is worth you turning off your ad blocker and letting the ad roll because that's how much you want that uh, content. <laughs> 
So they go on. Um, let's see, sixty foot nine percent use some form of video piracy on a regular basis. Whoops, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards rather than forwards. You. Nobody knows that. Nobody knows if you're yeah, going well, backwards I do. or forwards. The impetus, <laughs> okay, this was great. The impetus for the study came when Mira Belli caught her two teenage sons illegally streaming shows. By the way, if that's all she caught them doing, she's a lucky woman. Yeah, what kind of shows? <laughs> <laughs> streaming shows and ad blocking. And in her admonishments, discovered they didn't know they were doing wrong. Oh, yeah. Now, come on, Tom. <laughs> I remember saying that, too, back in the day when we had those magazines hidden in the woods. I didn't know it was this wrong. Is, this is written like it's, <laughs> like it's true. Most of those in the 18 to 24 demo don't even think it counts as piracy if they're merely streaming a TV show or movie instead of downloading it on their computer. And just 18% of them believe that streaming video without paying is wrong. That's such baloney. <laughs> Every single one of them knows that it is "quote unquote" wrong, Tom. If Otherwise, I take, they wouldn't be putting those ad blockers up there. <laughs> if if I were to take a forty-two inch four K TV, brand new, in the box, and put it on the the corner, with a sign underneath that says, "You're welcome to pay for this if you want," <laughs> <laughs> and then I just walk away, what's going to happen? Well, obviously, you left it there. That means you should take it. That means if I can take it, that means I should take it. Otherwise, you you wouldn't have been so foolish as to leave it there. You know, there's a reason that in public radio and non-commercial radio, you know, when they do uh, 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 donation pledge drives and so on, Mm. that the statistics are something under 10 percent, usually under 5 percent of the listening audience actually gives supports financially the radio station because everyone knows it's there for free why should i be a sucker and pay for it unless i you know uh, subscribe to the mission of the brand or the uh, uh, some other or there's an incentive or something um beyond that so this is not unusual behavior <laughs> is my point right no Side of the times. While it's easier to convince people to stop doing something if they believe they're wrong, it's much more difficult to convince them to stop doing something they don't perceive as wrong. (laughs) Oh, man. So how does the entertainment world set these youngsters on the right path? First, by putting up those walls that don't let them watch content while using an ad blocker. Tom, I have to tell you, I went looking for for, uh, how to block ad blockers. And there is a whole. Ad there is a whole. There are web pages on. Here are tools you use to block, to block ad blocker blockers. Oh man, I'm getting lost. This is like that other thing you sent me about, ad block plus and. That's I'm right. Where they're confused. adding ads. Yeah. No, I don't even want to get into that because that's too confusing. But let's just say that it's an evolutionary race to the finish between ad blockers, ads. Ad blocker blockers and ad blocker well, blocker wait a blockers. Minute. You don't want to get into it. You're the one that sent me the article. <laughs> ad Block Plus starts an ad tech platform to sell ads. Yes, they're selling ads themselves. It's true. It's brilliant. Well, I don't understand why, though, because, you know, to say, well, this is an acceptable ad, isn't that a slippery slope? That doesn't matter. Look, find a way to stop something that people dislike and then get, get it back those to them. people to adopt your solution. Yeah. And then make money trickling that same shit right back onto them. And guess what? Consumers accept this stuff. Just like they accepted all the ads on their ad-free cable channels that they're paying a huge amount of money for. Well, that is true. I just, I couldn't find Yeah, but they didn't, they didn't call cable channels ad blockers, did they? <laughs> no, but look, I couldn't find anything in real life. I, 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 I even started thinking, what, what is like this? I mean, I couldn't, Im- can you imagine selling umbrellas? <laughs> to stop rain from getting you wet and then punching little holes in the umbrella. I mean, that's how brilliant this idea is. Listen, if it's the rain that pays for the umbrella, yes, I can. (laughs) (laughs) Follow the money. All right, it's time for Rants and Raves, Tom. What do you have this week? Oh, I actually, surprise, surprise, have a rave. Wow. Yeah, and it goes out to everyone who has stopped fighting the reality of this crazy marketplace and decides to dance with the madness instead Mm -hmm. of complaining that they're doomed and people are stealing things and blocking (laughs) things. So there's a bookstore in Dallas, Texas called The Wild Detectives. And what they're doing is they're using online clickbait titles to get people to read the classics. Hmm. So they have this thing, it's a site called Litbaits. And it's a site that's hosted on Medium. 
And if you go to it, you'll find clickbait like photos and headlines, like a la BuzzFeed. Mm -hmm. So I just went there and I saw a photo of a home destroyed by like weather with a caption underneath that reads, you'll never guess what happened to this Kansas teen <laughs> after a tornado destroys her home. And then when you click this link, it takes you, it redirects you to an online version of Frank Baum's classic, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. And you can read the entire book on a medium site. Mm -hmm. And I like it. Now, wow. is this going to get people to read the classics? I don't know. But it's the kind of attitude I think we should be taking when approaching people in the marketplace and trying to get them to change their behavior. Go where they go. Think like they think. Mm -hmm. Connect with what they want to connect with and, you know, what they do. Provide value and, for God's sakes, have some fun. Make them feel good about themselves and their experience with you. It's really about all any of us can do anymore. So did you find one like um, Boo Radley's Identity Revealed? <laughs> That's, see what I mean? That's a, I would have clicked that. <laughs> I love that. That's terrific. You're so right. I like right. it. Yeah. All right. I have a couple that, again, I'm irritated about, <clears throat> which seems to be the theme today. <laughs> First one from uh, Tube. I don't know if these are rants or raves. I think they're rants. Um, tube Filter. This four-year-old has the most viewed YouTube channel in the world. <laughs> 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 Move over. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm already he's four, resentful. He's four? Four. That's not dog years. That's like Oh, we got to get him on the podcast. There see you if go. we can get some more listeners. There you go. It's like, I think you can take advantage. You don't have to pay a four-year-old very much either. <laughs> um, PewDiePie and Justin Bieber move on over because Ryan Toys Reviews. Four-year-old Ryan has emerged as a standout within the humongously popular... <laughs> children's toy unboxing space oh, i'll bet you never thought there'd be a children's toy unboxing space did you uh no more than 585.3 million views in july alone how many 585 million in <laughs> july <laughs> alone so what I love about this is, you know, by the way, you have to file this under the category of parents pimping out their kids with too many toys and not nearly enough decency, okay? Well, I'm rushing to the store as soon as I get out of you here. you got to go to the toy store. <laughs> I mean, this whole house is a, this is the thing. They had an interview with the parents, and you got to listen to the way the parents rationalize this adventure. It's so funny. We spoke with Ryan's parents who wished to remain anonymous. <laughs> No kidding. <laughs> About why they decided to be, uh, start making videos, how they've spun this pastime into a full-fledged family business, and what makes Ryan, uh, what Ryan makes of his newfound viral fame. So here's what mom says. Ryan was watching a lot of toy review channels. <laughs> one, day he, <laughs> one day he asked me, how come I'm not on YouTube when all the other kids are? So we just decided, yeah, we can do that. Uh, and dad jumps in, and I love this. This is total rationalization. <laughs> Another reason we started is because Ryan has a lot of extended family outside the U.S., so YouTube was a great way to share childhood memories with them. It's also a great way for us to spend more time together as a family and to bond with him. <laughs> Tom, what? if you watch any of the videos... This is not about riding the carousel together as a family at the amusement park. This is about crass commercialism. This is about opening toys and playing with them. <laughs> oh, I couldn't be more irritated. Come on, Mark. You're just, you just—you know—you're upset because he's got like 584 point and whatever yeah, nine only, million more. Tom, <laughs> that was just in—that was just in one month. You know, can, July can open, could be. Can we open boxes on a podcast? We've got to figure out how to get these numbers up. I got to figure out what kind of boxes to open. <laughs> it doesn't. Well, nobody knows. Apparently, you, you don't it doesn't matter. They can't see it. You just, <laughs> you just do that, and then you know, say something. <laughs> so here's the other one, and I'm equally <laughs> irritated about this. Ah, this is a theme with me today. This one's from um, New York Post. Pulling naked ladies was a great move for Playboy. <laughs> oh, I remember that. We talked about that. We didn't talk about this, did we? Yeah, we no, talk, remember? They, yeah, no, nah, we did. Playboy we magazine, about, we, we, they took all the naked women out of the magazine. Yeah, remember sure, we but we this? didn't talk about the outcome, though, did we? No, I, did, I predicted it would be bad, but go ahead. What, well, what here this? you go, Tom. 
Americans are liking what they're not seeing in Playboy. The 63-year-old men's magazine has seen newsstand sales jump 28.4% in the first six months after its decision to drop nude photos from its pages. Ah, I made a bad prediction then. Well, so you would think until you actually read the article. (laughs) No nudes is good news for Playboy, which gained wider distribution on newsstands starting with the March issue. Then that has sparked an increase in single copy sales, 47,000 a month, according to uh, one source. Unfortunately, Tom, (laughs) barely 10% of Playboy readers these days pick up a copy on newsstands. Most readers are subscribers, and there the news is not so sexy. (laughs) Paid subscriptions, it seems, dropped 23%. Now, I did the math. Because here, the Playboy, here's the Playboy guy said, everything's going according to plan. He said, yeah, we, exactly. launched, we launched a new version with the March issue. We anticipated some longtime subscribers, which is, you know, which is code for old people, would not be happy with the new direction. <laughs> so we took our ad base rate down. And we anticipated the trend. We're encouraged by the number of new subscribers, more than 100,000 so far this year, which is an indication that the magazine is starting to generate interest (laughs) among a new group of readers, which was our goal all along. Readers, I might add, who can find pretty much the same content in about a dozen other magazines on the newsstand or by subscription. But here's the thing. I did the numbers, Tom. Uh Uh-oh. You're a numbers guy. (laughs) That's right. 100,000 new subscribers. Now, but they had a net decline of 23% in subscriptions. Okay. That means that they had 750 or 1,000 or so subscribers uh, before they lost 23%. Now, when they lost 23%, if they gained 100,000, but they still lost 23% on net, that means they lost about a quarter of a million subscribers. In other words, one out of every three. (laughs) The title again of the article, Tom, Pulling naked ladies was a great move for Playboy. <laughs> yeah, you know what's interesting, though? It, it, it's like, so the people walking by the newsstand, I don't know what they're doing to maybe get that magazine like in their, in their faces. So they're doing something there. And then so people are picking them up. So we've got, an, oh, an additional 20% of the people picked them up. And the people at home are opening it and seeing there's nothing in here. <laughs> <laughs> It's even worse than that for a couple of reasons. First of all, as we did discuss previously, you can't take the Playboy brand and, and pretend it's not what it's been for 65 years, number one. Secondly, I, in my travels, as I go to the airport bookstores and so on, that's one of those magazines that's still behind the little, you know, obstacle barrier. So they're still treating it like Playboy's always been treated in at least those stores. Um, also, you know, the Playboy channel is every bit the Playboy of days gone by. So they're sending mixed messages. It's no yeah, surprise I like here it, at Mark. all. I'm telling you what they're doing. I haven't seen it, but I can guess this <laughs> because I've seen it in every other category. They probably make the cover look like something that you wouldn't be ashamed to open up on an airplane. <laughs> so that's why magazine stands, <laughs> right? That's what they're doing. And then, and then the people at home get it, the subscribers, and go, what the hell is this? <laughs> well, judging by the photo on the article, probably the sexiest photo in the magazine is the one on the cover. <laughs> exactly. That's Media Unplugged for this week. Please remember to subscribe to us at iTunes or on Stitcher. And while you're there, please rate the show. It helps other folks discover us in case you feel that's a good thing. You can also catch us at art19.com, Radio Inc., Media Village, Net News Check, and the American Marketing Association. And you can listen to us when you're not otherwise doing your work because, as Tom indicated, you can't do both things at the same time. It's impossible. You can follow Tom on Twitter at Tom Asacker and Mark at Mark Ramsey Media. Send us your questions and comments using hashtag Media Unplugged. If there's a media topic you want us to cover, tweet us. Now, Tom, we have to give our little clue at the end of the podcast here for anybody who's listened this far to prove that they've actually listened. What is the secret word today? The secret word? Unbox. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hashtag <laughs> unbox, folks. Catch up on older episodes at our website, MediaUnplugged.net. Special thanks to the producer of Media Unplugged, who's on vacation this week, so don't blame him if the production is shoddy. Jeff Schmidt, exciting audio for media. You can find him at jeff-schmidt.com. For the fantabulous one and only Tom Asacker, I'm Mark Ramsey. Thank you for listening.